we're in uh, Mark chapter 8, Matthew, Mark. If you can turn there in your Bible, Mark chapter 8. There's 16 chapters in Mark, so we're at the midway point in this gospel. Remember, this is the shortest gospel. It goes really quick, and right here in the midway point, uh, we're going to shift gears. The first half was mostly an introduction of who Jesus is, an introduction to Christ. From now on, we are heading inexorably to the cross. We're marching to the cross. From now on, we're going to see the cross before Jesus. He set his face like stone. He is going to go. He came to this earth. He was born to die for our sins. He's going to go do that. He's going to die on the cross. The reason Christ came was to die for my messed up, nasty self. The reason Christ came is because we can't save ourselves. We need somebody to come and pay for our sins, our sins. And we're going to see more clearly than ever today who Jesus really is. So again, imagine you're in that first century church. There is no Bible. There's no New Testament yet. And uh, Mark has just written this book. It was carried to your church. It was copied many times, brought to different churches all over the place. It's brought to your church, and you're hearing chapter 8 for the first time. We're going to see who Jesus really is. It's a heavy chapter. This chapter will challenge you. This chapter is meant to challenge you. We're not supposed to just sit there and be neutral about Jesus Christ. We're called to make a decision. All the action in, chapter, in this chapter takes place around northern-day Israel and southern Lebanon. So some scholars think, this is interesting, there's no consensus on this. I'm not sure. But some scholars think that when Jesus fed the 5,000, that was a miracle for a Jewish audience. But this time, Jesus is going to feed 4,000. And it may be that there's a substantial number of Gentiles in this audience since it's in territory that's traditionally Gentile. Jesus was up in an area that was heavy with Greek influence. Let's read now uh, from Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, and let's just see what God has for us. Mark chapter 8, 1 through 5. During those days, during those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. Remember we said that's one of the hallmarks, one of the ten principles of Jesus' ministry. He cares. Jesus cares. Do you care? Do we care about our neighbors? Do we care about the people that drive by on the street? Do we care? Well, if we don't, we're not like Jesus. We're like the other guy. I have compassion for these people, Jesus says. They have already been with me three days, so, and they have nothing to eat. So he, I don't know. If I'm there, I'd like him to have compassion like three days earlier when they missed the first meal. But, but it's okay to miss meals to hear Jesus teach. So Jesus keeps going, and on the third day he says, you know what, we ought to get some food for these people. If I send them home hungry, they're going to collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can we get them enough, uh, enough bread for them? Now remember, Jesus already previously fed 5,000 men and their, and their wives and children uh, miraculously. So uh, when Jesus says, we're going to get some, we need food, these, I wonder if the disciples looked at each other and says, yeah, but where are we going to get food here in this desolate place to feed so many? And Jesus kind of looked at them and maybe he winked and said, how many loaves you guys got? Because that's what he said last time. He said, how many loaves do you have? And he divided them up and fed everybody. And they, they probably smiled at one another and said, seven this time. And, and then they, the people sit down, and he starts miraculously dividing up. Then there's also some fish there, and he divides it up, and he feeds everybody. And there's baskets and baskets of food left over from just this little simple beginning. I think that would have been a neat moment because they already knew uh, what Jesus had done previously. We know how this story goes. So in this desolate place, Jesus proves that he can provide. Jesus can bless. Have you ever been in a desolate place in your life? Kind of looked hopeless? You look around you and it doesn't look good. Jesus can bless even in the desolate places. We should also think that for 
someone who is spiritually hungry, in your life you know there's more to life than, than sucking air. You know there's more to life than a, cer- a cycle of waking up, brushing your teeth, going to work, coming home, going to sleep, waking up, brushing your teeth, going to work, coming home. It's just this endless cycle, and all you're doing is getting older. Your, your, your body's breaking down. You're getting more gray hairs. What's the point? There's more to life than that, and you feel a hunger. This, this world's not the way it's supposed to be. It's messed up, and then you're upset with yourself. I'm not the way I should be. I'm messed up. What is wrong with me? This is called a spiritual hunger, and when you know that you're spiritual hungry, Jesus is the bread of life. And only he can provide Okay, now let's skip down to verse 11. I'm going to go 11 through 21. The Pharisees, remember that really religious group? They really understood their Bibles well, but they didn't have a heart for God or for other people. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. Isn't that too bad? When the most religious people didn't see God right in front of them. The most religious people were were so busy being critical and imposing their religious rituals and their rules that they didn't even see God right in front of them. They didn't see that God loved them and he was there for them. Instead, they're critical of him. The Pharisees came and they began to question Jesus, to test him. And they asked him for a sign from heaven. He's been doing miracles all his ministry. He sighed deeply. He was hurt in his heart, and he said, why does this generation ask for a sign? All you want is another miracle, another miracle, another miracle, but nobody cares about God. Truly, I tell you, no sign is going to be given to you guys. Then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf that they had with them in the boat. So they're talking about, we don't have any food, we don't have any bread. Jesus said, be careful, Jesus warned them, because Jesus is still thinking about the Pharisees. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, he's saying that because we don't have any bread. Uh, because they were talking about bread, Jesus talks about watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and, the, and, and uh, Herod. And they said, well, he's probably talking about the fact that we don't have any bread. After their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets uh, of pieces did you pick up? Uh, Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you pick up? Seven, they answered. And he said to them, do you still not get it? They were looking at their situation instead of looking at God as their provider. But Jesus was trying to talk about something more importantly. There's a temptation for religious people. Uh, and when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we... we join Christianity, there's a temptation there. The yeast of the Pharisees is the attraction of legalism. You ever hear that term before? Legalism. When you're trying to relate to God just by a set of rules, I do this, check, do this, check, do this, check, and now I don't have to care about anybody. I don't have to love God. I don't have to love other people because I went through my religious checklist. And he says, be careful of that. There's a temptation for religious people, if I just do the right things, go to church, put money in the offering plate, then it doesn't matter where my heart is at. I can buy God off by good attendance, or I can buy God off with a check in the offering plate. The, the yeast of the Pharisees is an attraction to legalism and also probably attraction to popularity. The, uh, the Pharisees were very popular, and that's an attraction for, that's a temptation for the church, isn't it? We're going we're gonna to stop preaching the truth because we want to be popular. We're going to stop preaching the entire Bible because some of it is unpopular in our culture. That's not politically correct. And so we're just going to tone it down or forget about it or, or not t- teach the entire gospel. Now, the yeast of the Herodians, the Herodians were like King Herod and his family. And the Herodians were, were ruling in several parts of this land, and they had a close connection with the mighty Roman Empire. The yeast of the Herodians would have been an attraction, again, to, to popularity, but this time popularity with the elite. I want the important, the movers and the shakers. I want them to like me. And then 
the, uh, the attraction of political power. And Christ is warning his followers that legalism, popularity, and political power, they can be traps for God's people. Because we start to put our hope in the wrong things instead of in Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to remember that Mark is known, remember, as the memoirs of Peter. Remember, Mark was not an apostle. You remember that? Mark's not an apostle. Peter was an apostle. The early church believed that Mark wrote down what he learned from the apostle Peter. Think about that. We just saw Jesus ream out the apostles. Who told Mark this story? Peter. This is incredibly honest text here. This is an incredibly honest book where Peter's saying, yeah, we just didn't get it. Peter's telling the story of how they didn't get it, how, how we thought he was talking about food, because all we could think about was our stomachs. And Jesus said, all you can think about is your stomach? Don't you guys get it? I want you to be careful of these temptations, these traps uh, of popular, uh, popularity being accepted, the trap of political power, the, the, the attraction of legalism, because that will ruin what God is trying to do. God wants, God is a God of relationships. He wants us to have a real relationship with him. He wants us to actually care about other people. And don't settle for this playing religious games. Don't settle for the attraction of, of power and, and popularity and being accepted. Don't settle for, for legalism. It's such a cheap substitute for God. And so we have this incredibly, it's vulnerable, isn't it? Because Peter is not trying to bring glory to himself. This book isn't written so we all say, wow, Peter's awesome. Peter's honest about their own, his own struggle here. He didn't get it. He was fixated on himself, on his own gut. He wasn't thinking about the things of God. And Peter is so honest here and so vulnerable. Thank you, God, that we have an honest book. The only perfect person in this book is God, is Jesus Christ. This book wasn't written to glorify the Jewish people. It wasn't written to glorify the prophets. It wasn't written to glorify the apostles. It's written so that we can know what a good God we have. There are no perfect people. God is perfect. Peter admits that Jesus was harsh with him. I, that would have been hard to write down. Yeah, I totally missed it. I was just thinking about myself. And Jesus took it to us. See, the New Testament wasn't written to make the disciples look good. If this was a book written by human beings, what would it do? You would write it so that the apostles could get rich. You'd write it so the apostles could get girls. You'd write it so the apostles could be big deals and, and lead armies and and live in big palaces. Instead, this is an honest book that doesn't bring attention to the apostles. It's an honest book, and the apostles, almost all of them, actually died going to foreign places to tell people, Jesus loves you, God is real, and he can forgive you. And they lived this life because they knew Jesus had died, but he rose again. God is real, God's love is for real, and forgiveness is possible. This is an honest book. You're not going to find a book this honest written by any other people group, written anywhere else. This book is from God. It's different. Everybody tracking with me? Can you see how this is different? It's, uh, so Peter says, yeah, we were thinking about our stomach. We were thinking about the meals we missed, and Jesus was trying to teach us something. We missed it. Well, it's going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse for Peter, poor guy. Let's skip down to Mark chapter 8, and we're going to look at 27 through 30. Remember, if you've been in church all your life or you've been to church a lot, your biggest enemy to encountering God, your biggest obstacle from being moved by the Holy Spirit is familiarity. You've heard these stories a million times before. And so you yawn when something that shatters the earth is right in front of you. This is earth-shattering, what we're going to see in these verses. Let chapter 8, this is a big deal. Chapter 8 is heavy stuff. Chapter 8 is important. Let's look right here from 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. Incidentally, only the Bible calls it Caesarea Philippi. It's called by a different name. We're going to get to that later uh, in secular texts. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? This book was written 2,000 years ago. Jesus has 12 followers, okay? 
he can gather crowds, but he only has 12 real core people. And one of them is going to betray him for silver, going to betray him uh, in order to, to get some benefit from it. 2,000 years later, Christianity is the largest religion in the world. All over the world, there's people meeting, some smaller churches than ours, some bigger churches than ours. All over the world, people are saying, Jesus changed my life. I was going down the wrong path. I was full of selfishness. I was only thinking to myself, I had all these wrong beliefs, and I met Jesus, and he changed everything. All over the world, from, from jungles to, to, to colleges to, to, to rich businessmen to, to, to folks that don't have two nickels to rub together, Everywhere, people are finding Jesus Christ, and their lives are changing forever. And right here, 2,000 years ago, with this small group of people, Jesus says, who do you think I am? Well, if you're an atheist, or if you're somebody who does, has never thought about this, you can say, well, he's just some traveling guy. He's just some traveling guy, some traveling teacher, who happened to rock the world, just like this book said he would. And this book was written before that happened. Jesus said, who do you think I am? By the way, whether you go to heaven or hell depends on how you answer that question. Where you spend eternity. This question still echoes 2,000 years later. And everybody on this planet has to answer that question for themselves. Who do you think Jesus is? They replied, some people think you're John the Baptist. Remember King Herod had John the Baptist's head cut off. Some girl did a coochie coochie dance. And Herod says, I like that. I'll give you whatever you want. She said, give me the head of John the Baptist. So this, this uh, prophet, John the Baptist, got his head cut off. And now people are saying, maybe Jesus is John the Baptist popped back up alive again. Other people thought he was Elijah, another prophet who didn't die. Elijah actually just went straight up to heaven. So a lot of people thought maybe he came back down again. Maybe this is Elijah. And still others thought, well, maybe he's one of the other prophets. Do you understand what's going on here? Everybody knew Jesus was different. This guy's a prophet. Something is going on here. This is not normal. This is not life as usual. Jesus is, is something we've never seen before. And Jesus says, okay, fine, but what about you? I don't care what other people are saying about me. What about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. You're the Savior. You're the anointed one. You're the one that God has set apart to save the world. Did Jesus warn them, don't tell anybody more people about this? He was on a process. He was on his mission. I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, today, friends, in your heart, who do you think Jesus is? Now, in America, so many people can say, oh, he's God. Yeah, he's God. But do you really believe that? If he's God, get on your knees. If he's God, say, Lord, forgive me. I've been living my life without you. Ask yourself, who is Jesus really to me do i care who is jesus really to me what does he mean to me the famous author c.s lewis remember those movies the narnia narnia chronicles the books of narnia with that big lion aslan c.s lewis uh, had a, a regular radio program on bbc radio and there were a lot of people at that time after world war ii just like there are today they think that uh Jesus was just a good guy. You ever hear that? Oh, he was a good moral teacher. Jesus Christ really was a good person. Well, obviously he changed the world. And so C.S. Lewis was responding to people that thought Jesus wasn't God, but that he was a good teacher. Here's what C.S. Lewis said. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing that we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. You get that? Jesus said, I forgive your sins. Who can do that? Jesus said, I came down from heaven. Who can do that? So C.S. Lewis said, a man who says the things that, that, that uh, Jesus said, you can't just say he's a, a, a great moral teacher. That's the thing we cannot say. Jesus, the things that Jesus said would not make him a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the same level with the man who says he's a poached egg. That's a pretty, that's lunatic. Or he would be the devil of hell. 
you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was either, neither, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Jesus is not letting us off the hook. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Even today, this question remains. We need to answer this before God. And our eternal destiny hangs on how we answer that question. That was a good moment for Peter, by the way. <laughs> Peter said, you're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. You're the, you're the holy son of God. But unfortunately, there's more to the story. And this is an honest book. So we're going to keep reading. Let's look at uh, 31 through 33 in your Bibles, chapter 8. Chapter 8, 31 through 33. Then Jesus began to teach him that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, little cue, when we try to take God aside and rebuke him, it's just a bad idea. Uh, I'm, you know, how old are you? I'm 46, God, and you created the entire universe, and I think I got a little bit more insight than you on this. I mean, what? We, we think we're going to lecture God. So he takes Jesus aside, and he begins to rebuke him. You're not going to die. What are you talking about? But Jesus turned and looked at his disciple. He rebuked Peter. Now, I wonder how Peter told this story to Mark. Yeah, he looked right at me, and boy, was he hot. Get behind me, Satan. It's just bad when Jesus calls you Satan, you know? And he said something very true here. He said, Peter, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You don't have spiritual eyes. You only have earthly eyes. You only see in this life from the perspective of your gut, your pocketbook, your bank account. You've only got worldly eyes. You're not seeing things from God's eyes. Again, this is a brutally honest book, not a book that glorifies people. One moment riding high in our faith, the next moment we look like Satan. Ever been there? I heard the pastor of the largest church in the world, uh, they, they've got a stadium that f sits like 50,000 people and they have multiple services. This is in Korea. And I, w I was listening to him speak and he said, as a young man, I'd go to church and I'd be praising God and then I'd made a, a homemade BB gun and I'd go, I'd run home fast, get on top of the roof and as people were coming out of church, I'd shoot them with my BB gun to see them react, you know. He says, and he said, and I know what you guys are doing because they had buses and buses. I mean, this is a big church. He says, you're all here and say, hallelujah, praise Jesus. You smile, say brother and sister, and then you fight with one another to get a place on the bus. One moment we're riding high in our faith and say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I can do this. I, I love this. And, and the next moment we're talking to somebody and we're just looking like Satan. And God looks down at us and we're not looking like his son Jesus. We're looking like Satan. Now we know that because of Jesus, his blood covers all of our sins. God's not going to judge us on our sins. But if he stands before us, what's he going to say about our attitude, about our priorities? What's important to you? Are the things important to you the things that are important to God? Or are my priorities just like anybody else who's not saved? My priorities are just like people who don't know Jesus. Guys, if that's true, something's wrong, right? Right? Can I, I mean, that's a good time for an amen. Yeah? All right. And here we have another question to answer, brothers and sisters. What matters most to me? What matters most? Is it the things of God, the concerns of God? Learning to love people, is that important to me? God is love. 
God calls us to love others. Self-sacrificially, putting others' needs before our own. How about be learning to forgive? You think that's important to God? He said, I'll forgive all your sins. And then we turn around and say, thank you. And I am not going to forgive. What? Where does that even come from? Do we care about exactly? It's like, it's like the king who forgave his servant uh, uh, the national debt. The servant's so happy, and he turns around, and he grabs somebody by the throat and says, give me my 20 bucks back. How does God feel when he sees that? My kids aren't getting it. How about growing his church? That's important that we go out and share this love. Jesus died so that people could come into his family. Let's live our lives drawing more and more people into his family. Raising Christian kids, not just kids that stay out of jail, but kids that grow up and they love the things that God loves. Leading people to faith in Christ. These are things that are important to God. Are they important to me? Or do the concerns of this world mean more to me? Popularity, stuff, money, relaxation, putting everything in front of God. If Jesus stood before us like he did Peter, what would he say? Would he say, Dan, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. By the way, when I say Dan, please put your own name in there. You don't have to think, yeah, what would he say to Dan, you know? The point is put your own name in there. Unless your name is also Dan, then it's okay. Yeah. There's another point. Boy, whenever I'm like beating up Dan up front, he probably thinks I'm beating up him up here all the time. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's another point I want to look at. Uh, Jesus has been revealed as the Savior of the world. And for the first time in Mark, this is the first time in Mark we see that he states clearly that he, his purpose is to die and ra rise again. He came here to do something. We can't save ourselves, so he came here to do it for us. And he does this, by the way, in the northern part of Israel, in this Gentile-controlled territory near the source of the Jordan River, which is an important symbol in, in Jewish culture. In the spring, there was like three or four sources of the Jordan River, and the main one at that time was a spring that came from a cave that was being used for animal sacrifices for the Greek god Pan. And Jesus goes up right near this cave, says, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Messiah. The Gospel of Matthew goes into more detail about this incident. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answers him, upon this rock, this truth that you've just spoken, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. The gates of Hades are not going to overpower it. The testimony that Jesus is the Savior, the Son of God, and the foundation of the true church, and not even the gates of Hades can stand against it, and the cave that was dedicated to Pan that contained the spring that fed the Jordan River was known as the Gates of Hades. Now, this wasn't the only one. In, in Greek culture, wherever they have found a cave or a big hole, they often called it the Gates of Hades. This, th Jesus went right up here to Caesarea Philippi, and he, in where this cave was that was dedicated to the Greek god Pan. Now, in most places, uh, there's only a few places in ancient culture where there was actual temples to Pan. Usually, Pan was worshipped in nature, unlike Zeus, who was worshipped in cities. But, but uh, in this city of Caesarea Philippi, there were several temples to Pan, and then the main place was this cave. The cave's still there today, but it's filled with rocks from earthquakes. Uh, there was this cave where the, where the spring would come out of, and a lot of water would come out of there, and they would sacrifice their animals to Pan there. And all along, there were carved niches, and they'd have statues of Pan, and there was a large statue of Pan that was made out of wood, so it was more like a nature statue. And Jesus goes right to that territory and says, the gates of Hades cannot stand against my church. We're, we're, paganism is on its way out because I have come. Josephus, this uh, Jewish historian, again, not a Christian, but he talks about Jesus and John the Baptist. Josephus tells us there was at that time in this cave a deep pool of water, and they couldn't find the bottom. They had plumb lined it down to 800 feet and could not reach the bottom. And the Greeks, again, they would take these animals, they would sacrifice, they'd cut them, and they'd sacrifice them, 
and dump them in the well, and then if they spotted blood coming out of the well, they would assume that the Greek gods had accepted their sacrifices. The whole region was known as a center for the worship of Pan. Now, Caesarea Philippi, the first part, Caesarea is for Caesar, named after Julius Caesar, and Philippi was named for Philip the Tetrarch, who was part of the ruling Herodian family. This is the ruling Herods, the King Herods. So, but it was also known as Caesarea Panius. Get it? Caesarea, the land of Pan. It was called the land of Pan. It was dedicated to the Greek god Pan, half goat, half human deity. The region that was known as Panion in the modern day Golan Heights, which you hear about in the news all the time, uh, dispute between Syria and Israel. Uh, Pan was the god of desolate places. We noticed that phrase earlier in the chapter, didn't we? Uh, Pan was the, was the god of military victory. In fact, he would put panic into the enemy, and that's where we get our name for, word for panic from. He was the god of music, the god of theater, the god of shepherds. It was known for debauchery and sex. The goat-like god with horns is also a Satan-like figure in uh, Indo-European paganism. Now, things get even more interesting. A passage from a book I found online called The, the Classical Mythology of Milton's English Poems uh, states that according to Greek historian Plutarch, during the reign of Tiberius, Emperor Tiberius of Rome, who was a Roman emperor at the same time that Christ died and rose again, listen to this, people began to believe for some reason that Pan had died. There's only two Greek gods that ever died, and Pan was one of them. The news of Pan's death came to, this is what Plutarch says, an Egyptian mariner named Thamus, his boat was, boat was stuck in a calm near the Isle of Paxi. And a mysterious voice came to him overseas telling him that when he got to the city of Pelides that he should proclaim that the god Pan was dead. When he got to the city, he shouted in a long, loud voice, Great Pan is dead. And when he did, the whole city was filled with lamenting and weeping. So around the time of Christ's ministry, when he publicly declares the gates of hell cannot stand against me, it's proclaimed among the, the Greeks that Pan was died. During Christ's ministry, his death and resurrection, this rumor has started that the Greek god Pan has died. Now, the Bible teaches that Greek gods are nothing. With Greek gods are nothing. Uh, but there is interesting symbolism here, and Christians have noted it over the years. Uh, many Christians, including G.K. Chesterton, who we like to quote from, have seen this imagery as significant. Chesterton wrote, Pan died because Christ was born. Not Pan actually died. The mythology of Pan was extinguished by the power of the living God. It is almost as true in another sense that men knew Christ was born because Pan was already dead. A void was made by the vanishing world of the whole mythology of mankind, which would have asphyxiated like a vacuum if it had not been filled with the theology of Jesus Christ. In other words, when God in flesh stepped down to earth, it was the beginning of the end for the old mythologies. Pan was a false god. Jesus, truth incarnate. Pan was the god of desolate places. Jesus brought a feast to the desolate places. Pan brought panic. Jesus calms our fears. Pan was the god of theater. Jesus stepped into the stage of human history and writes his own story across the continents in the hearts of true believers. Pan was the god of shepherds. Jesus is the great shepherd, calling all lost souls to him to find peace, to find rest, to find forgiveness. Pan was the god of lust. Jesus brings perfect love. Pan died when Jesus came on the scene. Death couldn't hold Jesus down. Jesus said, I'm the strong man that plunders Satan's possessions. And remember, what Satan possesses was the souls of people. And Jesus came right in and said, I'm going to take those. Thank you. Tied up Satan. And, and everybody who comes to faith in Jesus Christ has been wrestled out of Satan's hands by Jesus himself. Okay, I want to finish up this powerful chapter now. Remember, Jesus had just called out Peter, telling Peter, get behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're doing. You have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell cannot stand against it. These are harsh words. Why is a loving Jesus so hard on Peter? And again, because our, if our hearts are filled up with the love of this world, we will miss life in the eternal world. And many people so full of this world's concerns are going to miss heaven. There's nothing more tragic than missing heaven. They're going to miss the next world. 
because they don't really care about God and they don't really care about the things that he cares about. Let's finish up the chapter now from 834 and I'm going to read to the end. Then he, this is Jesus, called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, there is just after he told Peter, you only have the concerns of this world, not the concerns of God. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up my cross and follow me. Nobody gets to heaven riding on a high horse. Look at how good I am. Look at all the good things I've done. Look at how important I am. Look at how much money I have in my bank account. Look at how, how much I've done for the poor. Look at how much I care. Nobody gets into heaven boasting about how good they are. You have to deny yourself. God's ways, they're better than my ways. God is good. I need a Savior. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross. And remember, the, Jesus, this is before Jesus died on the cross. When we take up our cross, it's the hard things in life, the difficult things in life, the things that we want to run away from, the things that we don't want to have to deal with. He says, carry them for me. Carry those hard things for me, and you follow me. It's not enough just to say, sign your piece on a paper. I, uh, I believe God is real. I believe Jesus died on the cross. Sign my paper, and now I don't have to care about him. Got that done. Jesus knows. You're not going to trick him. There's no such thing as cheap God insurance. Jesus wants our heart. He wants our soul. Just like when two people marry. You don't want them to just sign a piece of paper, but they don't care about you. Jesus knows and he wants us. So he says, follow me. Stay close to me. We talk about being so close to Jesus, like his dust covers us. So close to Jesus, we can feel his breath on our faces. For whoever wants to save their life, who's ever only thinking about themselves first, they're going to lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel, his message that Jesus can save, that heaven's doors are open for everyone who believes, whoever loses their life for the gospel is going to save their life. Then listen, verse 36. <coughs> How do we start today? I said, imagine if everything went your way. If you got everything you wanted. You went to hell. What kind of a deal is it? <coughs> okay, verse 36. Famous words Jesus said. What good is it for you to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your very soul? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? What would you sell your soul for? We sell our soul for a lot of things all the time. Entertainment, we sell my soul for, for another buck. I can't go to church because I got to, whatever. We're always doing stuff, and it's, it's scary to miss out on heaven, to miss out on love and forgiveness because we sell our soul so cheap. Guess what? I think my soul is cheap. We often live like our soul is cheap. Jesus bled for your soul. God thought it's worth the blood of God. God cares about our souls way more than we do. God calls everybody to come and have faith in him. So Jesus said, Jesus is saying, what good is it if everything goes your way, yet you lose your soul? What are you going to sell your soul for? <coughs> 37, or what can you give in exchange for your soul? Verse 38, if any of you are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, what's a culture? God looks down and says, that's a sinful culture. If you are ashamed of me at the workplace, if you are ashamed of me at school, if you, if you, if you don't become a Christian because, oh, I don't, I don't want to be associated with those people, if you are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. I don't want to be ashamed of the God because, guess what? The cross is the power for salvation. I'm going to heaven, not because I'm good, but because he's good. I believe in this love. I believe that God is good and he's reaching out to save anybody, and I don't want to be ashamed of that, and I don't want to hide that. Why is Jesus so hard on Peter? Because he doesn't want Peter to miss it. Let's love people enough to tell them uncomfortable truth. Let's love people enough. Let's get out of our own comfort zone so we can share the love of Jesus and bring people to heaven. When you go to heaven, the day you die and you pop up in heaven, no matter what you went through in this life, you're going to say it was worth it. No matter how hard life got, you're going to 
You're going to breathe in the air of heaven and say, oh, I'm so glad. And you're going to want to look around and see that people are there because you lived your life to spread the love of Jesus. Isn't that true? Let's do everything we can. Say, God, I want to be more like you. I want to care about people the way you care. And I want to love other people in your name. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, uh, we're weak. We're imperfect. We're sinners, Lord. But you love us anyways. We're so easily distracted. And yet you're always there. Father, a lot of things battle for our attention span. And sometimes we forget to put you first, maybe a lot of times. But Lord, you're always there when we turn back to you. Father, help us to be people that fix our eyes on you. We don't want to look at our problems. We don't want to just fester under bitterness and complaints and being miserable. Lord, we don't want to spend our lives angry with other people. Lord, help us to live for you. Help us to live for love. Help us to love other people enough to tell them things that are outside of our own comfort zones. And Father, please, when you look down from heaven, please see us as a people that are eager to be used for you. Please use us as individuals and as a church, Lord God, to draw more people into your kingdom. Thank you, God, for this message. Thank you that you are so great and powerful, that you, the greatest of all, you humbled yourself, you became just like us, you suffered, people spit on you, they beat you, they mocked you, and you still you loved us and you died for us. And thank you, God, that my sins can be forgiven because of what you've done for me. We love you, Jesus. We know our love is weak, not like yours, but help us to love you more. Pray this in your name, amen. Thank you for watching Foundation TV. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.